Okay, thank you and uh, welcome everyone. I see in the room, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, great scholars, many of whom I've actually referenced in my in my work. So it's, it's uh, great to see you here, a bit intimidating, uh, but um, thank you for having me today. Uh, so my name is uh, Mara Bordignon, and uh, today I'm going to be discussing my uh, research uh, focused on open education and uh, critical uh, policy. Um, so I, I just want to start off just with in terms of my positionality and land acknowledgement, just a little bit of background as to who I am. Uh, so my name is Mara Dejusti Bordignon, and I'm a second year PhD uh, candidate in the Critical Policy, Equity and Leadership Program, or CPILS, at Western University in Ontario, Canada. I am a mature student, having been an academic librarian uh, for most of my career. Uh, so I have insight and interest into issues uh, surrounding the creation, storage, and dissemination of information, uh, particularly OERs and, of course, open access. Uh, I am of Friulano descent from the region of Friuli Venezia Giulia, Italy, and immigrated to Canada as a child. Uh, so my research deals with inequity as being rooted in traditional structures. Uh, so my research acknowledges treaties and Indigenous ways of knowing uh, in an effort towards partnership, collaboration, and reconciliation. I am a visitor to the lands that I'm currently in on and acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapawek, and Chinookton nations. Uh, so today I'm just going uh, to, for what I'm going to be discussing today in terms of my outline, uh, I'm just going to be going through uh, my, my research study as it exists so far. Uh, so uh, purpose and content, some of my research questions and methodologies, some of the framework, uh, a framework that I'll be using, uh, and then in the discussion in terms of uh, discourse and policy, uh, the cr critical framework and the significance of my research. Okay. Uh, so I've completed my first year of coursework in my PhD program, and I've uh, completed my milestone uh, in terms of a literature review. I'm currently working now on my research proposal, uh, which deals with more outlining my theoretical framework and my methodology. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today, it, it really is the, the culmination of my work from my first year as well as from my literature review. Uh, and I focused my uh, research study on uh, open education. When I, I first began, I actually uh, started off with subsets of uh, 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 variations of it, thinking I might want to focus on open uh, access or open educational resources. But then as I really dug in, into the literature and the research around um, these, these topics, I realized that there's, there's so many layers and there's so much complexity um, that I wanted to focus on open education. So that way I could, I could um, uh, bring in all the elements, even from open educational resources and open access. So I, I could be free to discuss that as well. Um, but basically, I'm looking at uh, the context is Canadian post-secondary education um, with a focus on universities as opposed to colleges, uh, make it a bit too wide, but that's where I've narrowed it down. And I'm looking at uh, scholarship and teaching practices, so open education, uh, the influence, of course, of, of neoliberalism, as you, you see the dark cloud there and some, some things that can happen in that in the issues there. Uh, and then openness ideology as a public good in e-democracy. So this is where, where I'm focusing my um, research. So my main research question uh, is what discourses are influencing open education in Canadian higher education? Um, so I'm looking at uh, discourse as knowledge and uh, I'll, I'll be going through in terms of discussing what I found in my literature review, uh, but as well, I'm also uh, going to be highlighting some discourse 
And this came through in the literature review, but as I'm working through my um, theoretical framework and my methodology, I realized that um, some of the documentation that I found and discourse, and I'll explain a little bit later in terms of how I treat or how I defi uh, define discourse, uh, but that plays into the analysis that I'll be uh, doing. So I, I am looking at critical policy analysis of some of the discourse and the discourse I'm treating that as, as policy. And then uh, that's my, my first main area I'm gonna be discussing. And then the second um, area is in terms of the, uh, the theoretical framework uh, and my approach to, to how to um, um, structure my study. Okay. Sorry, one moment, just making sure I, I uh, keep to my notes. <laughs> uh, so I, I just wanted to uh, first discuss before getting into a bit of the literature, one of uh, a key um, framework that that really resonated with me is the uh, open educational practices framework. Uh, and this stems from the work of Kosugbu and Boskert in 2018, um, but it's also based on work by uh, Hodgkinson, Williams, and Trotter uh, from 2018. And uh, I, I like this uh, because it visualizes well uh, and puts everything into perspective around open education. Uh, so what you see here is the center is uh, openness as a philosophy. Uh, then we see open education uh, theory, uh, open education practices as, as actual practices. And then as we, we go out, uh, we see um, open uh, uh, education approaches. And, and what's nice about this as well is that there's uh, an, an element of, um, oh, so I'm just going to move my screen here a little bit. Uh, the approaches, the uh, evolving adaptive open approaches. So you see labor, culture, pedagogy, uh, finance, legal issues and technologies and, and those dimensions and how they interplay with open education. Uh, in terms of research, it's important to, to understand that. Uh, so again, a very important uh, framework, which, which helps me uh, in, in the study to kind of put everything into perspective. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you may have seen that, that framework. Uh, so in, uh, uh, throughout my, my literature research, one of uh, the things that I, um, I saw in the literature was, uh, I, I'm seeing an evolution, an evolution uh, where scholars have really taken a critical approach to how to understand how open education has evolved over time. Um, so if we see um, the open education consortium definition, and I'll, I'll just read it here, um, as encompasses resources, tools, and practices that employ a framework of open sharing to improve educational access and effectiveness uh, worldwide. Uh, but we see that in the past uh, couple years, there's been an emphasis on um, social justice, equity, uh, emancipation. So scholars have really focused on that and, and I've, I've been drawn to that. Um, so we see this in, in some of the work that's done by Lambert in 2018, uh, where uh, they outlined three principles towards social justice. Um, and then of course the work of Hodgson, William and Trotter, uh, and they base it on some earlier work from Frazier's uh, 2005 social justice framework. Um, and then we move into some work from, with uh, uh, Cronin from 2020, Lane in 2016. So you're starting to see an argument here that it's not just uh, say open education initiatives themselves. It's actually um, a, a discussion towards transforming structures or systems in which those types of initiatives are existing within. So, um, and, and you know, here the, an argument is made that it's not just um, an initiative by itself. And as, as a lot of good could come out of, say, an OER initiative and so on. 
but the system itself under which it operates, that has to transform as well. So that way it, it kind of buys into uh, the same type of ideology, that openness ideology. If the system buys into only a very, you know, neoliberal ideology, then that initiative may not work. So that's, again, very uh, interesting ideas there. And then with some um, uh, work of uh, Bali at all in 2020, so uh, you could see the, the progression of dimensions towards a social justice uh, focused uh, uh, definition for, for open education. Okay. Uh, so here it's, um, I'm using the work here from uh, 2017, and this would be, um, sorry, uh, uh, Hoyt, and just some of my notes here, um, Hoyt and Monetti, and uh, I don't want to set up because I, I've read a lot about the uh, the danger of a binary. So you see here a difference between say open education and closed education. Um, and again, scholars, even though you could differentiate and, and you know, make comparison charts and, and Hoyt and uh, Medi Manetti do that in terms of the differences, uh, you know, in terms of the purpose, transparency and all those um, elements that you see there. Um, there's been a lot of scholars that have have um, said, well, it's not as simple as a binary. It's not as simple as, you know, open is good and closed is bad. Uh, it could work. It's it's very complex open education and it can work along a, con a continuum as well. And here I, I reference and I, I think I, I see Leo in here, but I reference the work of Haviman um, and others that have really brought that that forward. So um, there's a lot of complexity there. Uh, but just a, a little bit of comparison here where I, I have come across literature where uh, they position uh, if a system or a structure is based or leans towards neoliberalism, you do have more of um, centralized power and there could be negative effects of that. Whereas if you uh, go towards a system of a commons where you decentralize power, you, you do give a bit more, there, it's positive in the sense that there's more autonomy um, and rights given to creators of that, that um, uh, information. So some issues picking up from the, the literature, uh, especially open determinism, especially in virtual environments, um, the premise that uh, technology is a savior um, as opposed to uh, the creators and, and uh, their, their creative outputs and the pedagogy that they, they drive. So just some issues around that. Uh, De-emphasis on teacher contact, uh, student isolation, uh, pirating, of course, by the private sector. So in terms of uh, platform providers and publishers, uh, there, there's issues there. Uh, appropriation and exploitation of academic labor. So if you think of things like uh, peer review and, and how that occurs in uh, scholarly publishing, um, social and political di uh, dimensions, and then some barriers to mainstreaming, and this is specific to, to OERs, and, and I list some there. Uh, so in the progression of, of my literature review, it's, it, it's uh, studying open education in terms of what scholars um, are, are bringing about new understandings in terms of their research on, on open education. It's, um, it's impossible not to come across things uh, specific to OER or open access because all these are interwoven and and it's an international discussion that has um, that is uh, guiding open education. So in terms of its development, it's in terms of its change, in terms of its progress. So uh, during my literature review, I came across a lot of uh, discourse. So this is how I frame uh, discourse. I'll get into a little bit more, uh, but say starting in 2002 with UNESCO's uh, OER definition, uh, and then how that's that's evolved. 
And then um, in Canada, some of the things that uh, have also been influential. So uh, we see here, you know, federal action plans, more so for open uh, government, uh, but also the tri-agencies, uh, federal open access policy for publications, which affects, um, you know, scholars uh, who are publishing. So there's a lot of interesting um, discourse around open education as OER and, and open access. So th these are just some of the highlights that I want to note. Uh, and then if we continue here, again, some other influences, especially uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you see calls for opening up data, opening up sharing uh, with the, the World Health Organization and UNESCO. So those are occurring and they're big pushes on the periphery. Um, and then we see here more recently, you see Ontario, so the, the, the uh, province Ontario with the Ontario Virtual Learning Strategy and the funding support there and, and um, the, the big support within that uh, DLS strategy to support open educational resources. Um, and then the, the um, uh, BC campus uh, out in British Columbia. Uh, and that was the started before uh, eCampus Ontario, and, and you see the, the growth and the proliferation and acceptance uh, of, of uh, those types of uh, tools and initiatives around OERs. So, okay, I'm just going to make sure I pull up my notes so I don't forget some important. Um, okay, so. So in terms of uh, approaching how uh, open education discourse is uh, uh, formed in, in the Canadian context specifically, um, I'm taking a, a critical uh, post-structural uh, lens or framework to it. Uh, so when I say uh, post-structuralism, it's looking at um, structures already in place and, and deconstructing those grand narratives. So what's already there, I want to take a, a critical eye to that and deconstruct that. Um, so under post critical post-structuralism, uh, the framework, uh, I would be looking at the practice of publishing and teaching. Uh, so that would fall under an open education uh, umbrella. Uh, now, under this practice, I, I argue within this framework that the, um, sorry. Oh. sorry, can everyone see the screen? I accidentally lost my screen for a second. Yes, I okay. Can. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so under, under this framework, uh, again, from a critical lens, uh, the uh, neoliberalism would objectify uh, scholarship and teaching so that it, it turns into a commodity or problem, or, or sorry, rather a, a product. And uh, problematization, so that, that would be seeking truth and subjectivity in governing practices. Uh, so I'm taking a, a Foucault, so a, a Foucaultian lens, which, uh, under that lens, discourse is defined uh, as governing practices. So you can include policy as a governing practice by, by government or rather anyone who's in, in a position of power to say define, um, has the power to define what open ac uh, education is, also has the power uh, to include and exclude groups or voices um, around uh, open education. So that's that's how I'm framing that there. Um, and I'm also drawing in the work of some policy scholars some critical policy scholars. And here I refer to Ball uh, and in 1993. And um, 
uh, Ball equates policy as discourse because policy ensembles or collections of related policies exercise pro uh, power through the production of knowledge and truth. So again, it's, it's how open education is conceptualized within this type of documentation, or as I would say, policy. Um, and uh, again, policy is not just a, a, uh, a document labeled policy, it could be a number of policy texts, which I would I would include uh, anything from say policies per se, but it, it could also be in the form of uh, media releases, uh, syllabi, um, any type of internal institutional documentation, um, agendas, uh, and so on. So again, any document that governs in the sense that it, it um, uh, leads or, or guides the way people think about open education is what I would be including in my um, methodology for analysis. So hopefully that was clear. There's a lot of uh, terminology there. So I uh, apologize if hopefully I haven't lost. Um, okay. Uh, so the significance of this, of, of my research in this sense, uh, is that open education has, uh, or rather I argue or I've seen from the literature, is that it has an openness ideology, uh, but it is still prone to uh, neoliberalism. So in, in, another, in other words, uh, if a system is, again, if it's predominantly leans towards neo neoliberalism, um, even open education initiatives, uh, could be monetized or captured in some way. Um, then there's actors that are influencing discourse. So we're looking at uh, eCampus Ontario, um, just um, eCampus Ontario, the Tri Agency, uh, UNESCO, the Commonwealth of, of Learning. Uh, so these are our. Uh, organizations led by scholars and people who are practicing at actually on the front lines of these initiatives. Uh, so documentation and, and uh, um, uh, production of knowledge coming from these actors is influential and it, it is changing the landscape. So it's important to, to recognize that. Um, the discourses that are guiding practices. So I, I would be looking at, uh, you know, open policy uh, uh, documents and statements. So things like the Ontario's virtual learning strategy. Um, and then uh, my last point is just the lack of critical uh, policy research. So looking at open education through the lens um, of uh, critical policy analysis. Uh, and that that's my interest there. I think that, that that's a, a um, a place that more work can be done. Okay, so uh, thank you. I, I'm. Uh, I think I'm. A, I think I'm a little under time. Uh, but I. I, uh, I want to thank thank you for for listening to my talk. So just. Uh, so uh, this is the the two topics that I will cover today. Thank you all for having me. Um, here's my outline, a little bit about my background, a quick overview of a riddle, which I thought would be appropriate for the graduate students who are in this GoGN network, um, and then uh, a short introduction to my preliminary doctoral uh, research and Q&A at the end. So my background, I teach history at Northern Michigan University. I'm an American. Uh, I live on the beautiful southern shores of Lake Superior. It's majestic here. I'm just a couple hours uh, west of Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. Um, and our, our little region has more um, culturally uh, to do with, with Canada than we do with the, with the rest of the state. So uh, finding the doctoral program at Athabasca University was um, a no brainer for me when I stumbled upon it. And uh, I've completed my coursework, defended my proposal, and uh, now I'm working on my dissertation and uh, uh, hope to defend in the winter, graduate in June. And I also have the great privilege of uh, being the interim managing editor of a Rodal um, for about the past year, um, while some uh, the managing editor Serena has been on uh, research leave. 
And so I wanted to share with you some things that are interesting about the history of Aroto and how it operates and how it is useful um, for uh, this particular GoGN network. So Aroto was established in 2000 and the name was originally the International Review of Research in Open and Distance Learning and later changed the name from distance uh, to uh, distributed. The mission is a rep read open access e-journal that disseminates original research theory and best practice in open and distributed learning worldwide. It aims to improve the qual quality of basic and applied research while also addressing the need for the translation of this knowledge into policies and practices that improve educational opportunity for learners and teachers. Erodal is an open digital publication for three reasons. First, Athabasca was an early adopter of the internet to support learning during the 1990s, although the faculty uh, who were there at the time, such as Rory, uh, will tell you that it was a fight to switch from the correspondence model um, to using the digital technology. But even so, um, it was well positioned to utilize the digital technology for publication purposes. Second, uh, digital costs are, well, frankly, lower than hard copies, uh, so that's a great reason. And then third, uh, the founders really wanted to harness the internet to maximize the global reach. Erodal is available free of charge to anyone with internet access, and there are no article submission charges. And open access is inherent to the mission. Uh, because the more widely knowledge is circulated, well, the more likely it will be applied um, to solve global problems and enhance quality of life. So Rodal is funded primarily by a $30,000 per year grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, or SHRC uh, is what it stands for, um, which is a Canadian federal agency. So interestingly, um, SHRC rejected the first Rodal grant and ironically, uh, Shirk did not accept open access journals at that time. And we can all just kind of give our collective, oh, how could they have done that, right? Um, but uh, the Erodal team campaigned and had open access accepted in the next call three years later. And Erodal became the first open access journal to receive Shirk funding. Now, Shirk requires journals to be open access to receive funding, uh, which shows the impact of the open publishing movement as it has changed over time. So Rodal currently publishes four issues per year with the special issue option to replace a regular issue. A regular issue now usually contains 10 research articles, which is a drop from previous years because the 2017 external review of Rodal recommended reducing from six or seven issues per year with 12 research articles each to four issues with 10 research articles each. So a regular issue may include literature reviews, book reviews, notes from the field, and research notes, which do not necessarily count toward the minimum 40 research articles required by the SHRC grant per year, although sometimes literature reviews do count, kind of depends on their word count, um, if they fit into the 4,000 to 7,000 uh, word count requirement. Um, writing shorter book reviews, notes from the field, and research notes are excellent opportunities for graduate students to publish earlier, um, early in their career um, while they're still working on their coursework and their dissertations. So there's typically one special issue per year, but not always, uh, like in 2018. Um, so special issues coalesce on a specific topic, as seen with the examples um, here on the slide, and have a guest editor who is an expert, such as the one about MOOCs edited by George Siemens in 2014. If you are interested in editing a special issue now or in the future, um, please type up a one page proposal and send it to the editor in chief, who is Rory McGreal. With over 1,000 submissions per year, the Rodal's acceptance rate is 11.4%. So we have to be selective. Erodal operates on the open journal system software. OJS is an open source software application for managing and publishing scholarly journals. Originally developed and released by the Public Knowledge Project at the University of British Columbia in 2001 to improve access to research, it is the most widely used open source journal publishing platform in existence with over 25,000 journals using it worldwide. If you have the chance to work with an open journal, I highly recommend gaining OJS skills. It is clunky, but it is also useful. So my stats are a bit outdated, uh, but as of 2018, Erodal um, ranked 
fourth of all ed tech and distance education journals, fifth of all ed journals, uh, was the only open access journal in the top 10 education journals and was the highest ranked Canadian education journal. So it is widely respected. In terms of user stats, um, the Erodo website traffic is heavy and regularly used by scholars worldwide, which leads me to a question for you. We can get into a little interaction here and I encourage you to post the responses in the chat. So here's my question. Which countries do you think represent the most erodal users? And what percentage of users by country would you predict? So for, for example, what percentage of total erodal users do you think are in Canada or other leading open and distance ed countries? I don't see anyone posting in the chat. Here we go. All right, so 25% US, 20% Canada. Thank you, Martin. Mostly US and Canada. Okay, good, Daniel. Any other guesses? All right, I'll go ahead and show you the results. Here we go. So those of you who said the United States uh, was prevalent, you are spot on. Um, but I have to tell you that as an American, this completely surprised me when I saw these statistics. In my experience, there are very few American scholars, at least that I work with, um, that are aware of, and let alone utilize Erodo, which um, I was horrified by, right? Uh, but uh, I was also surprised by the low percentage of Canadian users um, given their leadership with open, distributed, and flexible learning. All right, next I'd like to talk about the review process, and this will be helpful for uh, the graduate students who are in this network. So the review process follows a, a four stages, like most journals. Uh, the managing editor, me in this case, uh, for at least a few more months uh, until Serena comes back, uh, initially checks an article for scope, APA, grammar, blinding, and word count. Um, if it meets those criteria, which rarely <laughs> does it ever, I almost always have to ask for revisions, uh, at least give uh, authors one chance. Then I conduct a plagiarism check. And if it's acceptable, then I assign it to one of the editors. The editor then checks for academic quality, sound methodology, and the contribution of new knowledge. And many articles are rejected at the editor review stage. Those that are acceptable then go out for blind peer review. So there are over 1,000 reviewers representing dozens of countries worldwide, and they're all volunteers. Uh, so we rely on, on, their, um, on their voluntary efforts. The double blind review process means that neither authors nor reviewers know each other. And Erodo requires at least two reviewers with terminal degrees per article. A reviewer who does not hold a terminal degree may be selected as a third reviewer of a paper, which is great because more reviews are always better than fewer reviews, especially when the reviews conflict, which definitely happens. And here I throw in a shameless plug. So please sign up to review for Erodo and other journals because you will gain valuable experience, especially with tightening up your writing. Uh, while also contributing to reducing the bottleneck for publication. The peer review process is by far the slowest aspect of producing a journal, and it is especially frustrating for authors. Uh, so as a helpful rule to keep in mind, the Erodal editors suggest that authors conduct at least three or four reviews for every article they submit. And then finally, in the last stage, the editors hold a decision meeting to discuss the best papers. And then they strive to balance academic topics, global geography, and methodologies within each issue. Next, I'd like to share with you four other Rodal initiatives that could help you with conducting and disseminating your research. CIDR is the Canadian Initiative for Distance Education Research. It was founded by Rodal and Athabasca Center for Distance Education out of concerns that distance education research has not been sufficiently funded or disseminate it to be influential. 
Their solution was to bridge theory and practice by inviting scholars to present their research and contribute to the professional development of their colleagues. CIDR sessions are an excellent way to gain feedback on work in progress, like we're doing here, right? Um, as well as to share findings from completed studies. CIDR encourages graduate students to utilize CIDR sessions for these purposes. And here comes another shameless plug uh, for the next CIDR session. Uh, so on October 19th uh, at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, Randy Garrison, Marty Cleveland Innes, Norm Vaughn, Stefan Stenbaum, Deborah Dell, and Dan Wilton will present on the state of the community of inquiry research. It should be a great presentation. Another um, initiative is the OER Knowledge Cloud, which is a curated database and repository with the mission to identify, collect, preserve, and disseminate documents related to open educational resources. There are currently nearly 3,000 published records by more than 4,000 authors. If you are researching OER, you will likely find helpful sources in the OER Knowledge Cloud. And there are two planned future innovations. Podcasts and Twitter campaigns will expand the reach of Avrotal via different platforms. And these will be funded via supplemental short grant innovation money in the amount of $500 to $2,000 per year per platform. Beginning next year, one author per issue will be invited to create a podcast about their research to disseminate their findings. Keep an eye out for those next year. And Twitter has already been piloted with some success. The future tweets, uh, which will resume in 2023 and increase further in 2024, will highlight one article at a time and include a link to the article plus the tag. Finally, for the erotal portion of this presentation, I draw your attention to potentially overlooked website resources. The resources tab on the erotal website has descriptions and links to 24 open access journals, three distance education networks, open access books in issues in distance education from Athabasca University Press. So all of those resources could potentially um, prove helpful to your research. And now we move on to part two of this presentation about my dissertation research, which is the comparative historical origins of eight open universities in Canada and the United States. My research questions focus on the political, social, and economic circumstances, including institutional antecedents that shaped the origins and purposes of learning, by which I mean workforce practical um, or liberal, in other words, or the humanist love of learning purposes within eight open universities. Although I will not dive into those specific findings, I will share with you the comparative open educational characteristics that will likely be of interest to the GoGN audience. Here you see the eight institutions I selected. Six were created during the 1970s at the height of the mass expansion of higher education, and the two American institutions established during the 1990s were at the tail end of that mass expansion. Of note, only Athabasca, the Open Learning Institute of British Columbia, and the United States Open University have been referred to as open universities in the literature. And I am arguing that the other five meet the criteria of open universities when using Walter Perry's definition of an institution that is open as to people, places, methods, and ideas. Another useful definition is that an open university is usually, and I stress usually, a, a single mode institution with flexible approaches to study that cater to non-traditional students using distance education techniques and sometimes have open admission policies. So all of these institutions meet those criteria. I initially selected these institutions on the court criteria that at the dawn of the 21st century, they had open admission policies and offered entirely online programs and then went back to investigate the origins, but only came to the harsh reality a few days ago that the US uh, Open University actually did not have open admissions. Uh, so my committee and I assumed that the USOU embraced being open as to people with no admission requirements 
given its shared mission with its founding sister institution, the United Kingdom's Open University. This harsh reality of learning um, that it did not have open admissions so far into my dissertation research, right? I, I'm, I'm almost done with chapter six. <laughs> um, speaks to the, the problems I encountered as a historian tracking down sources because so few horses, sources exist and are actually available for research. If you will indulge me a moment, I will share a few examples of my research obstacles trying to play history detective. First, the Open University's archivist in Milton Keynes, as helpful as he has tried to be, has been unable to locate any of the boxes of the USOU materials that were packed up and sent back to the UK when the USOU closed in 2002. Second, and ironically, the UKOU's archives are shockingly closed with policies that require redacting personnel names, prohibiting researcher access to financial records, and not sharing any documents that might reflect on the institution's reputation, whether positive or negative, even from the 1970s, which I discovered since the UKOU um, had interesting pilot projects with several of the universities on my list during the 1970s. Third, as a historian, I encountered a maddening frustration uh, when I learned that a scholar conducted interviews with USOU officials shortly after it closed on the promise of anonymity, whereas uh, right education, <laughs> education, the uh, methodology in action here, which is completely different um, from how historians conduct their research and conduct oral history interviews, uh, which are almost always with the intention of naming names uh, documenting dates and the intention of making the interviews available for future research. Another obstacle was with the Open Learning Institute of British Columbia, because Dr. Louise Moran from Australia meticulously documented, cataloged, and archived the OLI's records for her eloquent dissertation, only to have a librarian later toss many of those primary sources into the garbage. The records that were miraculously saved that went that then went temporarily missing right so now this is just a fraction of them that, that were saved from the garbage um, so some of them went temporarily missing when thompson rivers university which was the institutional inheritor of the open learning institute moved to the mainland and some of their sources simply did not survive the move and i can't help but wonder if they fell off a boat and are washing around the pacific somewhere Fortunately, several scholars have generously gone out of their way, literally scouring their basements and their attics for old sources for me, uh, which was how I learned a few days ago that the USOU required an associate's degree for undergraduate entry. Um, this is when a, a former USOU official uh, located an old um, undergraduate catalog in his house. So. I'm now changing my criteria to the uh, institutions with open admissions or those branded as open. All right, so using Perry's definition that an open university is open as to people, places, methods, and ideas, I ranked the institutions in each category, and I will highlight a few interesting examples of each. Regarding people, the University of Maryland did not have open admissions until it later created the spin-off University of Maryland University College. But in its original form, it used off-campus night and weekend locations, including at the Pentagon, as a way to circumvent American segregation laws that prohibited African-Americans from accessing education uh, for six years until the monumental Supreme Court case Brown versus Board of Education required integration in 1954. Other than the United States Open University, which I mentioned earlier, um, all of the other institutions had open admissions from their origins. Regarding places, uh, University of Maryland University College was also interesting because it was the most open as to place given UMUC's close relationship with the American military with deployed troops in remote locations such as Greenland and Vietnam at the height of the Cold War. Faculty traveled to the students to meet in person and supplement it with correspondence methods when needed. Being open as to place presented significant logistical obstacles for UMUC. 
For example, in Greenland, the university had to deal with climate and terrain difficulties delivering course materials. And at one point, thought it was a good idea to drop a pallet with learning materials from an airplane, only to have the large package shatter upon landing, thus scattering the materials across the frozen tundra. So they all had to improvise. UMUC's experiences in Vietnam uh, during the war illustrate its openness as to place as well as methods. Teachers and students dealt with wearing uncomfortable protective gear, traveling through dangerous terrain, regular electrical outages, sometimes holding class by flashlight or in the latrine if needed, checking missing in action, killed in action list, and helping students navigate course completion when deployed without notice. This is where they had to switch to correspondence without any, um, without any notice, right? Furthermore, the university had to stealthily hide their courses in Cambodia and Laos when the Americans were conducting secret wars there. To do so, faculty flew in on CIA surveillance flights and the university masked those locations on paper as being in Thailand. Moving on, Sunni Empire State was also notably open as to methods because they ran the gamut from correspondence courses using educational broadcasting in coordination with public television and conducting prior learning assessment whereby students and their faculty members customized personal learning contracts. Students could take competency tests like at uh, the Regents External Degree, Thomas Edison State University, um, and Western Governors, but could also demonstrate their prior learning for credit via a portfolio assessment. This option at SUNY Empire State was not only limited to individuals, because entire groups could qualify for credit via a performance demonstration, such as a ballet performance or a police officer competency skill demonstration. On the other end of the spectrum, regarding being open to methods, the USOU was least open because they exclusively used UKOU course materials, which they sometimes adapted to the American context, and also exclusively used the UKOU's open supported learning method, which was characterized by high quality course packages and faculty tutorial support, but that did not leave room for other methods such as competency testing or performance um, portfolios. Regarding ideas, I went back to the institution's purposes of learning. So Western Governors was the least open because all of their initial degrees served regional economic and workforce needs in business and technology. And Mara, here we can see the impacts of neoliberalism in action, right? Uh, the other institutions incorporated at least some humanist purposes of learning with their initial degrees. Based on these open educational characteristics, I created the following spectrum of openness, with the USOU being least open, SUNY Empire State being the most open, and others in between. My spectrum relies heavily on being open as to methods, while also considering elements of being open as to people, places, and ideas. I grouped together regents, external degree, Thomas Edison State, and Western governors, primarily because they offered competency testing, which was so helpful to non-traditional learners. I grouped Athabasca, the Open Learning Institute of BC, and the University of Maryland, uh, University College together, because the first two relied on correspondence education supplemented with multimedia, and UMUC was somewhat traditional in offering in-person courses supplemented with correspondence only when needed based on a student's individual circumstances, but was remarkably open as to, to place and people. So this is my first attempt sharing my subjective spectrum, and it is still uh, very much a moving target. So with that, I welcome your comments and questions. I also encourage you to support documenting the historical record in your location by contributing documents to your institutional archives, conducting oral history interviews, and encouraging others to do so. Thank you.
Yes, thank you for this opportunity. So hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Ashman, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a doctoral student at Athabasca University, which is located in Alberta, Canada. And I work at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, which is located in British Columbia, Canada. Um, specifically, the KPU campuses are on the lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Tawasin, Semiamu, Kikai, and Coquitlam peoples. In my presentation here today, I'm going to share some of the results of the study I completed last year on perceptions of open pedagogy by faculty and students at KPU, and how I hope to build on this work for my dissertation, which will hopefully explore the intersection of open pedagogy with social justice in online courses. So like many, I have found engaging in open pedagogy to be transformative. Students shift from being consumers of information to being creators of knowledge, and this seems to visibly change their experience in the course. Um, at the same time, the role of instructors transforms from being a source of knowledge to being a guide to help students have impacts outside of themselves or beyond the classroom walls beyond their assignments and learning activities. So I was really curious to learn more and explore this more. So from 2020 to 2021, I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to complete an open education research fellowship at KPU, which is where I work. Ultimately, I wanted to know how faculty can support students who are engaging in open pedagogy, how faculty can set themselves up for success when using open pedagogy and how institutions can support faculty and in turn students who are engaging in open pedagogy. So specifically, my research questions were twofold. What are the perceptions of open pedagogy by faculty at KPU? And what are the perceptions of open pedagogy by students at KPU? So why KPU? I mean, I work there, but there are many open pedagogy practitioners at KPU, which made this a really great setting to investigate this topic. We have a ton of administrative supports for open education, significant library support, grant funding, and other supports for OER adoption, adaption, and creation, uh, PD workshops, and more. Open education is even embedded into the strategic plan for our institution, so it's a really great place to investigate this topic. So I compiled a list of 67 faculty members who had expressed interest in open education or open pedagogy, who were known to be engaged in these practices, who had expressed interest in these practices, who would attended uh, PD events on these topics, or who were simply known by colleagues to be interested. So I reached out to faculty members to get their consent to participate. And participation meant that they would be teaching one or more courses at KPU in the spring 2021 or and or summer 2021 semesters, where they would be using open pedagogy practices, and they consented to receive a faculty survey and they would distribute the survey the, the student survey to students on my behalf in each class where they were using open pedagogy so in total 11 out of the 67 faculty members agreed to participate and then there were eight faculty members who ended up providing responses to the faculty survey my student Participants were those who received the survey invitation from their instructor uh, of the class with the classes where they were engaging in open pedagogy in those same semesters. I cannot say for sure how many students ended up receiving the survey invitation because faculty were distributing it on my behalf and some faculty for whatever reason did not get back to me about the number of recipients despite multiple follow ups. So I don't actually know if all 11 faculty who agreed to participate ended up sending the survey to all eligible students. I do know that my incomplete tally put the total at potentially more than 700 students. Um, but again, I don't know for sure. And in the end, 55 students responded to the student survey. I don't have specific demographic information about the students who responded to my survey, but at KPU overall, 20% of students are international students, 64% of domestic students, and 
96% of international students are multilingual, 32% of domestic students, and 48% of international students are first generation students. 53% of domestic students and 64% of international students work 10 or more hours per week. And 68% of domestic students and 95% of international students are full-time students. In the surveys I provided to faculty and to students, I provided some examples of open pedagogy, which I sourced from faculty early in the survey development stage. And these examples are on screen now. In addition, my survey to students explored in parts how students perceived and valued open pedagogy in comparison to traditional learning activities, for which I provided examples of essays, quizzes, and surveys. So the surveys for faculty and students each asked open and closed questions. Um, and some of the questions in the student survey and some of the questions in the faculty survey were reused and or adapted from past surveys created by others shown on screen. And I'm going to share some of the most interesting results here. So for faculty, the top two themes for what faculty, what benefits instructors have experienced when using open pedagogy. Um, number one was how open pedagogy led to improved quality of student work and their assignments and the level of student engagement in the course, as well as how open pedagogy led to changes in positive changes in the dynamic and the relationship between students and their instructor. Um, if we're talking about benefits, we have to also look at challenges and there were challenges that faculty experienced. So time was the number one challenge. Time to prepare and plan projects, time to find and build partnerships and opportunities, time to complete the projects in the semester, to get student buy-in, just lack of time in general. Um, there were challenges in finding clients and community partners and, and building partnerships for opportunities, uh, lack of funding or compensation or recognition for open pedagogy work was another challenge, overcoming student anxiety to engaging in open pedagogy, the projects um, and getting student buy-in was another challenge, and lack of support from colleagues. So the results on the student side were really interesting to me. Um, and to be honest, I was expecting to see more of a bell curve or more of a distribution um, in the spread of responses than there were. Um, but overwhelmingly, the results were really positive. The perceptions of students were really positive to open pedagogy. So overwhelmingly, students found open pedagogy to be more valuable, more engaging, and more creative in comparison to traditional learning activities. Uh, students seem to have had a more motivating and more rewarding and enjoyable experience in completing open pedagogy compared to traditional learning activities. And students seem to think that their learning was better with open pedagogy in comparison to traditional learning activities. So students provided many responses and comments about what they liked about engaging in open pedagogy. Um, and the top few themes were how they felt their creativity improved or that they were able to use their creativity in their assignments. They really liked the flexibility and the choice that they had, that it was just more interesting and fun. And because they had the opportunity to collaborate with others. Students also provided many responses and comments about what they found challenging about open pedagogy and the top themes were time management again time and the amount of time required to complete the assignments uh, feeling uncomfortable with the process. Um, feeling uncomfortable with the assignment flexibility and the assignment choices, despite many students finding that that was still also a benefit um, collaborating with others. Um, was a challenge. Some students found that open pedagogy assignments were more cognitively demanding. And of course, there were students who experienced problems with technology. It's interesting to me to note that despite three respondents indicating they found collaborating with others to be challenging, that by and large, most people had a positive experience in working with others. So there are limitations to my study. The data was self-reported. 
there was unknown distribution of student participation amongst the classes because I was reliant on participant participating faculty teaching different classes to distribute the surveys to students. I didn't have full control over the timing of the distribution of the surveys and different instructors may be using open pedagogy at different times in the semester or choosing to distribute the survey at different times. So it's hard to tell whether students were receiving the survey in the middle of the messiness of their projects or at the end. Um, the study was done during COVID times. I mean, we're still in COVID times, but really in COVID times. So it's hard to discern whether some of the challenges as described by the students were the result of completing all their coursework online and at a distance, uh, the project parameters, or if there were issues with technology access, internet access, and equity. And of course, this study was done at one institution and a very unique one at that in BC. So it's unknown how transferable the results might be to other institutions in Canada. So based on the results, there are a few actionable items that are starting to emerge and I'll only be mentioning some of them here. Students could potentially benefit from having more time in in class and in the semester to complete open pedagogy projects and faculty could consider lengthening the amount of time available for open pedagogy projects. As well, faculty themselves could potentially benefit from having schedule or time release support and preparing and planning their open pedagogy projects. Students could potentially benefit from having even more upfront discussions with their instructors about the process and navigating other uncertainties posed by open pedagogy that aren't typically encountered with traditional learning activities. And institutions could recognize the innovative teaching practices faculty use when engaging in open pedagogy. And this is important because 89.1% of student respondents indicated they would choose to enroll in a course if they knew the instructor was going to be using open pedagogy. And this has clear potential impacts on course program and institution enrollments. Institutions could provide funding, networking opportunities and other supports for faculty who engage in open pedagogy work. So what now? Doing this project really piqued my curiosity even more about the impacts of open education and open education practices. So I applied for and was accepted into the Doctor of Education in Distance Education program at Athabasca University. And I now want to be exploring for my dissertation the intersection of open education and social justice and online courses. And I'm just beginning the second year of my coursework. So as Nancy Fraser has described, social justice is often conceptualized and described as creating fairness or equity within societies. Injustice Injustices can exist economically, politically, and or culturally, and can include areas such as race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, and more. And the actions taken to address injustices can be affirmative or transformative. Sarah Lambert has discussed what that while open education is based on the idea of education being accessible and available to all, that it does not necessarily by default work in support of social justice. Cheryl Ann Hodgkinson Williams and Henry Trotter built on the work of Nancy Fraser to develop a framework to analyze how open education resources and open education practices can address specific injustices and whether it is affirmative, so at the surface level or transformative and addressing underlying root causes of inequality. Mahabali, Catherine Cronin and Rajiv Jangyani use the framework developed by Hodgkinson, Williams and Trotter to analyze how the use and impacts of specific open education practices could be employed in a socially just way. So deep down, what I'd love to explore and better understand are the perceptions and experience of students in online classes where instructors are supporting social justice using open pedagogy. However, the logistics to undertake such a project kind of bends my brain a little bit, to be honest, about how to make that fit into the timeline of doing a doctorate where you're paying for program fees until you graduate and are stuck with the semester system. So 
while I'm curious about the student side, I'm also interested in the faculty side. And I think that I will be uh, better poised to understand how faculty actually conceptualize and operationalize social justice using open pedagogy to support social justice in online courses, as well as what motivates these instructors. <clears throat> Excuse me. So by understanding the experiences of faculty who actively support social justice through the use of open pedagogy, it could be possible to gain insight into what barriers they face and what gaps may exist in institutional supports and resources. And this is important because administration of higher education institutions could hopefully potentially use this information to inform, support, and improve their institutional efforts to work towards social justice, which would have direct impacts on the learning experience of students and the working experiences of faculty and learning support staff. So if I'm successful in moving this project forward, um, my methodology of choice would be phenomenology and my method of data collection would be a series of interviews with faculty. I don't yet know whether um, I would focus on faculty only at my institution or if I might broaden to include other institutions. I still have a tremendous amount of thinking to do. Um, as I mentioned, I've just begun the second year of my program. So I welcome your ideas, thoughts, resources, and reactions, and thank you for listening to my presentation. <laughs>